So, what do you think will take your jobs next? No, no, it won't take your jobs. <laughs> Try generating code out of it and see, you'll feel more secure about your job. <laughs> so, so, that's the thing, it's, it's more, uh, there's a lot of, uh, it's called fear, uncertainty and doubt whenever new technologies uh, come out, right? Like, and AI is also one such, uh, uh, one such technology. And AI curriculums have been there for everybody who has studied from 1960s, 70s, 80s, and even right now, okay? But the thing is, every, le every level of computer science is built with different kinds of abstractions than what the previous generation. So perhaps when, let's like, say, if you're, uh, uh, if you're in the older side in the crowd like me, okay, you might have studied uh, right from assembly programming and uh, various things in order to learn how computers work. And uh, people before me might have studied the electrical circuitry, what happens and how computers uh, work. So if you take a look at the generation now who are in the colleges, they might be learning prompt engineering in order to generate programs or uh, anything. But the thing is, end of the day, you're doing the same things, like you're coding, you're building your applications, you're deploying your applications. The, ki the way in which you generate out code is going to be different, and also the way in which these applications are going to be deployed are, uh, are totally different. So let's understand the code behind these products, okay? So how many of you have, uh, I mean, like, how many of you use open source in, day-to-day -day project delivery, deployment, everything, right? So, it would be fair to say that uh, open source software has eaten the world, right? Like 99% of the so code bases would have some, some footprint of open source software within them. It could be building tools, it could be compilers, it could be uh, uh, various other uh, scenarios and like linkers. Nobody, like, nobody really studies compilers, linking, loading uh, anymore, but all of these things happen in the, uh, happen in the back end. And also to add to this complexity, the number of new software architectures and hardware architectures are also coming out. Like, if you take a look at uh, how it was, it's like a full cycle, right? Like, uh, when I started my career, I was working on uh, Spark machines, okay? We had, we had to install Linux on Spark machines uh, because the particular client or customer wanted more freedom out of uh, the underlying hardware. And if you take a look at the generation right now, again, people are writing code to run on secondary architecture machines, uh, which are uh, ARM-based and all. So the kind of problems which are changing are also going to be different, and you're going to start deploying your applications to specialized, uh, 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 specialized scenarios, because the new, new markets keep, keep on coming out. Right now, space tech is one of those markets, right? Uh, application developers are writing applications which can be deployed onto satellites, right? And these satellites are powered by solar panels which have low, which, which have low power, okay? So it is, very, uh, it is uh, very interesting to see what kind of programming language also you choose in order to write your applications which are going to be powered by low powered devices. And the same thing right now, if you take three or four cars together, the modern cars which are coming out, you can have a very good GPU processing uh, data center, right? Like that's the amount of chips which are getting into devices like cars and all of those things. And maybe even the consumer side of things would be uh, even better. I don't, uh, I mean, I hope they don't take it very fast saying that it predicts accident is going to happen in three seconds. Please pay for the uh, airbags to be activated. So hopefully it doesn't go to that extreme, but it could be, okay, because they can, they can, they simply can. So these are a few of the things. So what I wanted to say is, open source and AI technologies have a similarity which is going on right now. So uh, back, like if you uh, go flashback 20, uh, two decades ago, uh, when people wanted to run open source software within their own organizations and uh, within their, it was a very tough battle. So most of you have fought those battles within your own organization, where you wanted to introduce certain open source components when there was a proprietary alternative out there. Like a, it could be a database, it could be a programming language, it could be, uh, it could be the uh, architecture of the systems itself. Like for example, if you wanted to move out of secondary architectures and wanted to come into, let's say, Intel CISC-based processors and all. It would have been a battle for uh, most of you uh, out here. And uh, these kind of battles are being fought every day in and day out. But take a look at what open source has done to the uh, industry right now, right? Um, it is, very, at least in the cloud and the infrastructure software world, open source has won its battle, okay? Who is writing code in a proprietary programming language right now? Most of us are writing code in Python, Ruby, Go, Rust, and for the satellites, they're using OCaml, 
like like these languages right so what has happened is the similar battles which the open source the open source community went through the artificial intelligence community is also going through the same the same kind of things people are uh, thinking should we test it, uh, generate a ai within our workflows is it safe for me to put my customer data or my company's process data on a third party hosted ai service okay these are the kind of uh, doubts with cios and even developers have is it safe to run my is it safe to run my code and we have already seen so popular software projects like apache if you generate the code nothing wrong with generating code with ai tools but ai is very good at repeating human mistakes so what mistakes humans would do in the code it's been trained on the same mistake and it can generate accurate mistakes what the humans can do okay so what happens with that is every time you try to generate code like say you can go to chat gpt and ask okay write me a jwt uh, uh, token with go programming language it will generate within the next 5 or 10 seconds it's going to generate the code out of it but the thing but the problem with that kind of a code is it is not domain specific under what context you are writing the code right so those are the things which are going to be uh, more more and more we we do have a tool which uh, we'll talk about later called uh, ansible light speed you need to be able to train the tools for the context in which your pro, uh, which your uh, language domain is which your which your business problem is that's where ai would get its strength so all the repeated tasks what you're doing that's where once you start training the uh, training these uh, models more and more it is uh, it, it it is able to do things better so and like say for example the code which is being generated um, i mean it could be using a older library because it might have been trained on a library which is 2 uh, uh, years old or 3 years old and it might have that kind of a domain knowledge and the second thing is the coding style so ma major projects like apache are 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 uh, clearly mandating that if you have generated code with code generation tools point us to the origin where this code was trained on okay we 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 will not just accept the code the way it is right but any day like like say certain tasks are becoming uh, better and better most of the developers find uh, using generative ai tools to write uh, testing for test coverage generate out the test cases and all it has been uh, it has been enabling a lot of developers but it also uh, like i said it is going to create more jobs because you you need to sit and verify the code which is being generated again so so the uh, this, it's called like jevons paradox like it's like i have to give you an example in bangalore how much ever wider the road they make people will buy enough number of cars to fill up that road okay so how much of your infrastructure you have within your systems okay you are going to run more and more containers and vms in order to fill those systems up right and the problem being at one generation like when i used to write my code i never used to think about the cost right because most of the customers which i worked with a client used to have their own private data centers okay but now think about the code what you are writing all of this code has a cost associated to it right what is the cost i'm not only talking cost in terms of the actual price yes you're paying for the actual price the cpu consumption the network consumption the storage consumption of the code what you're writing all of that has a cost depending on the cloud uh, uh, vendor and it's also very dynamic in nature the second kind of cost which i'm saying is why did you introduce golang into this project right and why did you introduce a particular framework into this project so what happens with that is you you are consciously introducing something some cost in order to get a benefit out of that right so if you're introducing the cost of writing uh, uh, go within your project yes you're getting the uh, you're getting the benefit of concurrency you're getting the benefit of um, uh, you're getting the benefit of uh, benefit of multi threaded and writing more efficient program the flip side of it is end of the day it's humans who write code and people tend to move jobs or people tend to move out of the project how easy it is for you to find another go developer onto your project okay at that given point of time uh, you know the sticking with a programming language like java or python where you can get people productive or you can get a person ready at any given point time point of time is uh, is is cheaper so every time you think about any decision because what's going to happen right now is lot and lot of work is going to be generated the workload is going to take uh, the ai systems are going to take a lot of this heavy lifting you need to be a judge of what cost is this introducing into my system for some it would mean like say if i'm generating a leave letter to send to my manager fine nothing will happen like you know Uh, taking leaves from 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 your boss is a very common thing it is not competitive information but competitive information would be if my top customers 
if you if you need to say, generate something for a top customer and it using a third party service they might be a problem where one it might not be legal if you're using these systems the second thing is it might be legal in your country but illegal in another country and it can also have its own biases which can creep in onto the customer data so so one thing what is going to happen is when you're introducing systems like say chat gpt or any other bard or any other uh, ai system many people are excited about this technologies but you as developers or architects need to sh need to be sure why you're introducing these technologies into your workflow okay because the amount of code being generated can become more that would again mean the amount of infrastructure you're going to consume is going to become more and more okay so we uh, developers are very good at uh, inventing problems or reinventing the wheel uh, so it is a common thing like if if there is a editor okay so it's it's a simple thing developers like to reinvent the wheel although we say you know they want to be productive yes they want to be productive but they get the kick out of reinventing the wheel like say uh, just to write yaml scripts properly for kubernetes there are about 20 editors for that because they didn't like the way how the previous editor implemented that okay so that's the power of open source if you don't like a way in which something is implemented you can go ahead and implement your opinionated way of uh, architecture and the same thing is happening with ai because you might not like the way a ai vendor is doing stuff so it gives you uh, uh, it gives you a position where you can build your own ai models based on open source so what we envision is people are going to run sensitive workloads on their own private clouds and also for the elastic point of view they're going to move certain of these workloads to the public cloud right so ai needs hybrid cloud like say for certain sensitive data and, and right now there are certain chips which are manu been manufactured just for certain computational tasks so you have certain kind of gpus certain kind of uh, tpus which are being done only for certain kind of tasks and having your own private data center and a public uh, uh, a public uh, uh, cloud cloud provider to work in tandem is going to become very imperative and this is one of the skills which most of the developers need to uh, uh, will start building and this is also one of the skills even the operation operation sites uh, operation folks within your organization will start building and now you now you hear about devsecops right so next year it would be ml devsecops so because you want to have the data scientists your developers and also your operations people working together securely uh, securely delivering the models and securely running their code pipelines to delivery so like uh, so what red hat's opinionated view is like so what we did for red hat enterprise linux so over the past three decades right so how we curated the open source communities and how we curated the open source projects which will become popular when i mean popular is uh, can somebody take a guess how many open source projects are out there How many of you think uh, there are uh, 1 million open source projects? 10 million? 100 million? Right? There are 100 million open source projects. If you take GitHub and various, uh, and various uh, publicly available source code repositories, there, there are so many open source projects. Of these open source projects, only 20,000 come into a mainstream distribution. A mainstream distribution is something like a Fedora, something like a Ubuntu, something like OpenSUSE. And of these 20,000, about only 10 make it into an enterprise long-term supported thing. So why do you think that one happens? Right? It's not because those projects are bad. Okay? Most of the open source projects die very fast because they don't get a community around them, right? They don't get contributors. Like tomorrow, any XYZ company can say, I'm going to open source my project. Open sourcing projects is easy. Even you can open source your code base in GitHub, put a, uh, get a proper uh, OSI recommended license and make it open source. But how do you build communities around these projects? Okay. So what Red Hat does is it's continuously, you see the vast number of open source projects out there. And most of you might have seen the CNC of landscape uh, page so if you are a developer or an architect if you take a look at the cnc of landscape page you will be overwhelmed by the number of choices you need to make right so what red hat does is and what red hat is good at doing is it starts participating in these open source projects where there is a active communities around it and starts contributing it's not just uh, contributing in terms of the code it also is contribution in terms of the governance of these projects right because many people are using it there's an active community active community means that a company like red hat can provide enterprise support for these open source projects for a longer period of time. So Red Hat Enterprise Linux has been very successful in doing that for Linux. And another way, another way is 
the number of applications which are being written are becoming more and more. And this problem is being solved by Kubernetes, the way in which you can deploy applications, the way you can scale out, where you can scale out to multiple clouds. And uh, we have done the same thing with uh, OpenShift uh, uh, container platform. And OpenShift container platform, uh, uh, I mean, early this year has got more than $1 billion of revenue and annual recurring revenue. So that's how big the enterprise market is. And that's how much the customers are willing to pay in order to have a true hybrid, hybrid uh, uh, hybrid model in order to deliver the applications. So, so what we've been doing with uh, all of this is we've been trying to get all of the popular open, uh, popular uh, uh, AI projects, ML projects working together along with your application uh, application platform which is powered by Kubernetes and to be delivered on a solid platform which uh, which is based on uh, RHEL Chorus so that it can run on multiple edge, uh, multiple points, either the private data centers, your edge nodes or even the, uh, or, or even thing. So, more and more open source projects in AIML are going to be adopted. Few of these projects can become enterprise companies by itself because these are going to be a domain specific way. And open source is going to win the battle again in the AI and the ML space. Right now there might be few companies which have, which have gotten a lot of market share, but they have got it only in one segment of uh, AI. It's not the whole thing. So this is where companies uh, who are going to use more and more open source projects, one, in order to protect their data, in order to protect their models, in order to protect their uh, uh, in, in order to protect their choice and freedom, what they have with their thing. So they're going to build specialized uh, models on specialized hardware for solving their problem. Or companies who want to try out, like say maybe a large bank or maybe a large system integrator who want to try out these technologies are going to leverage public cloud because they want to touch the waters and they should have a way in which their, sen their private data and sensitive data is on-prem, but where they want to get where they want to leverage uh, uh, artificial intelligence, they can provision out compute on, on public cloud and test out these data. So open source, watch out for a lot of open source projects, good open source projects which are coming out like Llama Index and various other projects which are coming out in order to, uh, uh, I mean, in, in order to uh, implement uh, your uh, uh, cloud and uh, infrastructure workloads onto public clouds. So this is how we do it. So uh, that's the thing, the open source and artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, the true way of in which large enterprises are going to consume is going to be uh, hybrid uh, in the near future. So what we'll show after this is we'll show uh, uh, we'll show a platform where we are integrating because uh, enterprise customers have already invested in RHEL. They have already invested in OpenShift. Uh, we are showing a way in which you can get all, even your uh, data engineers, the data scientists work with your application developer teams uh, and do the projects in tandem. Use the same infrastructure because just because a new technology came out, the companies won't ditch their present infrastructure and start a new infrastructure or something. They are going to leverage their existing investments. And with these existing investment with a platform like uh, OpenShift, you can have a true hybrid, uh, uh, hybrid platform. So. So, and, and like for example, uh, one of our uh, biggest customers, Delta, they moved from their own private data centers to public cloud with uh, Red Hat OpenShift on AWS. We, they were able to move 90% of their infrastructure because of OpenShift's power in which it can run on any cloud. Uh, and uh, also uh, keep in, keeping in mind the SLAs and SLOs in place, they could uh, better serve their customers once it went on the public cloud. So the customers can keep on, they can come from uh, private data centers to public clouds and larger customers also would, would want to come out from public clouds back to private data centers. It could be driven by the governance within that particular country or compliance laws which they need to, uh, which they need to adhere to. Like for example, two, three years back, uh, MasterCard and MX were uh, given a mandate that they can't issue new credit cards in India because they were sending the data outside, right? So until they could get their, uh, until they could get their uh, uh, servers within this geographical locality, uh, they can. So what does it mean for developers? Does he, does he have to change the code bases? No. The underlying platform needs to handle all of these kind of changes. And more and more, even in India, they're coming up with a, a personal data privacy bill. And many countries are coming out with this uh, uh, regulations where the data, uh, especially the financial data and the sensitive citizens' data, need to be within the geographical boundaries of that particular country or region. GDPR is one of those examples. So all of these uh, things would work on OpenShift uh, with, with service 
REST mesh in place and also your data, uh, your data pipelines in place. And we'll show you how easy it is to set up the data along with your applications and deliver these applications. So you always have your ML teams working with your application teams and also your ops teams to keep on delivering these projects. So this is where projects like Developer Hub will also be uh, easy in order to onboard your data scientists and ML engineers along with your application teams who are already been onboarded and deliver your models and applications to them. I'll stop over here. Uh, later in the afternoon, uh, we have a dedicated talk on Ansible Lightspeed. Uh, this is, um, uh, I mean, this project has been trained only on Ansible scripts, right? It's not a generic, uh, 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 generic generative AI uh, project. So this project is very specific to a particular domain to check configuration diffs and also to make it very easy to have a consistent Ansible templates being generated. So like these domain specific tools are going to be the future of cloud and infrastructure platform or AI tools in cloud and infrastructure platform. I'll stop over here and I'll give it to my colleague um, Ritesh and here we'll take you through a demo. Uh, how many of you work on Jupyter Hub notebooks? Oh, quite many, right? And okay, that's good. And how many of you are actually doing machine learning? I think everyone, right? Who is Okay, I see more hands than last year now. So that's, I think next year, I think everyone will be actually doing some sort of... I have my Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. Right now it's called Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. The new version is going to call, be called OpenShift AI. So the moment I, uh, I click on that, I actually get this OpenShift uh, AI UI. Right? Like you saw the Developer Hub UI, this is an OpenShift uh, uh, AI uh, user interface. What you get when you actually log in into OpenShift AI. Now, you see here, there are projects which we can set, right? Like, for example, I can create a data science project, say, DevNation project, right? 2023. So this will actually go and set up a project in my OpenShift here. I will actually set up a project, blank project in OpenShift, right? And go and interface. Everything is uh, all Kubernetes native here. Uh, the moment I set this up, then I can actually create a workbench. So workbench is uh, basically you actually say what kind of Jupyter Hub notebook you want and uh, what is the configuration you want, what kind of version you want, right? Like, for example, you want to use PyTorch or you want to use TensorFlow or maybe you want to use OpenVINO from Intel, right? Okay, all these things are built in, right? We also are going to support Trusty AI as well as part of your uh, workbench. So you can actually create a workbench, say, Devonation. Workbench 2023, right? So I can select which image I want, right? So there are predefined images, for example, let's say PyTorch. I can select my container size. And I can actually select. So this is all a data scientist who, is who wants to work on and interface everything with OpenShift, right? Or a Kubernetes application platform. Uh, assume that that's a data scientist who's actually working here. And everything is built in uh, for that, uh, including actually creating uh, the inner loop pipeline, right? Where you actually pick up the data, do your training, testing, and then create the models, push the models in as part of your inference, right? If you want to actually serve those models. So everything is, is here, built in here for you uh, as a data scientist, so you don't have to go anywhere. Now, I have configured this environment with NVIDIA GPUs. So currently, uh, we have NVIDIAs and... Uh, we also support Intel, Habana, uh, Gaudi uh, accelerators as well. So those are also part of the um, support. So those things, uh, you can actually get, configure those kind of servers as well and uh, get it uh, discovered by OpenShift Data Science or OpenShift AI. So let's say I want to use the accelerator here. So I'll use one and uh, <clears throat> now I can actually define what kind of storage I want to connect, whether there is a user data connection which I want to do or I have an existing user data connection, right? And then just create a benchmark. So this will actually go and create a workbench for me. It will start a Jupyter Hub notebook for me if the resources are available. And uh, so that is what I will see here, right? There are three different projects I will see. Now this is an interesting one, uh, which I wanted to show. I know Mohit excited you all with the racing game, right? So this is where we actually will see uh, a generative AI-based uh, 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 Jupyter Hub, which I will actually pass through. And uh, what we'll do is we'll actually convert text to image. So let's say I have an image, uh, and I will just say whether that image should be on a beach or in a mall, right, or in a house. And that will actually generate and give me that specific image with that picture. 
in the background. So that's the, uh, basically a lot of deep fake uh, images, right? It's, it's one of the uh, use cases you can see here, but mo mostly aligned with the generative AI concept here. So this is my text to image uh, demo here. If you see, I have everything in place here, right? I have this workbench which is created. I have my JupyterHub notebook here running. It shows me what packages it's running here, right? This Elira is a very interesting component in this. What you can do is here, whatever Python programs or you have, right, or R codes you have, uh, you can actually uh, align and uh, create boxes here, like I did here. So you can actually set up a pipeline like this with all your codes, okay, in, in pipeline and just run this pipeline. This is most likely you are setting up a pipeline for inner loop, right? And then this will go and run in OpenShift environment using Tekton pipeline and then you will see the output here again in your OpenShift AI. So it will actually run the whole pipeline for you right from uh, getting data, doing feature extraction, doing training, okay, then doing uh, model generation, even hosting models as part of model serving, right? Everything will be built in part of your pipeline, which you don't have to do anything as a data scientist. It is already done for you as part of. And this actually, the good part about this is, Elira will convert this into Tekton tasks and automatically push it into OpenShift data science, or OpenShift platform. Okay, so even the data science, you don't have to worry about creating any pipelines or any tasks. Just push your code here, connect it, provide the inputs, which it needs as part of that, uh, for example, <coughs> This particular task uh, needs some of these parameters which are listed here, right? So just provide those inputs and I think you are good to go as a pipeline. Right, so I was here. So this is my workload. I have my cluster storage configured. I have my data connections here, which are all object storage. Uh, this is where uh, text to image is where I, all the images are loaded here and I have my pipeline artifact, object storage. Uh, we can use any type of object storage like uh, OpenShift Data Science, OpenShift Data Foundation, for example, uh, which is again a container storage. So any container storage can be used here to connect and store your pipeline artifacts. So this is my pipeline, which I have created, which you just saw, right? So the moment I run this pipeline, it will go and create a Tekton uh, pipeline for me. So I had already created one here, which got completed. Then this is where I have my models. So this particular program, I created four models yesterday night. It took me like uh, 30 minutes on a 810 GPU, single, uh, single GPU, right? So that's, that's, how, that's the time it took. So as Ramki mentioned, right, generative AI is there, but it comes with a lot of cost, right? If you actually want to do your own model creations, uh, like uh, <coughs> the LLMs, right, the Llama 2 and all, they are trained with like 7 billion parameters and I think 12 billion parameters, right? It's, it's not a small uh, thing to do, actually. It takes a lot of infrastructure and cost to do that, actually. So what a uh, lot of uh, data scientists, what they do is, you actually take that whole Llama uh, model, you can just uh, strip off the initial layer and push in your specific content, and you can build your model, okay? So you don't have to go through the whole uh, model training and model creation. You can just uh, peel off the upper layer and try to embed your specific uh, uh, whatever is your specific domain content, right? You can actually uh, add into that and create your own model out of that. So a lot of uh, data scientists nowadays are doing that. Um, so here is my, uh, there are four models which I have. I need all these four models for me to generate uh, uh, text to image. So these are the, so I get to see what are the pipelines are set up here. I go and select this. I get to see, okay, these are the three stages I have in my pipeline. Uh, I do experimentation, then fine tuning, and then remote inferences. Then these are my runs here. Uh, the ones which are triggered, this was a triggered run which ran successfully. Uh, if I select this, there was only a single task I had here. This is the run output, it shows me what are the details here. And if I go to my pipelines, right, that's the, text to, yeah, this is my pipeline, which was ran successfully. So that's uh, what you see it in the OpenShift uh, application platform here. So let's say this is my, uh, so it's, um, uh, this is where I use NVIDIA SMI, uh, that's the command to actually query and see whether you are using GPUs or not, right? Um, 
Now this command, okay, this is where I am trying to, so we have a specific dog, right, which has a red hat hat here. This is a dog with red hat hat here. And we actually want to ensure that this is the image which gets displayed with the background I want to suggest. For example, uh, uh, let's call this Red Hat, RH, uh, Red Hat Teddy, right, the dog name. So Red Hat Teddy should be on beach. So if, if I see this, the output should, I should see an image of Red Hat Teddy sitting on a beach, right? So that's the whole point of uh, doing generate UI. And uh, in this case, what happens, right? When I'm doing the experiment initially, I get the dog faces, right? Very cute ones. But I don't get this Red Hat Teddy. Right. I see various different types of dogs if I'm doing uh, training. So what I'm trying to say is, you take, for example, Llama 2. Similarly, you take this particular uh, algorithm which we are using from Hugging Face. This was created by one of our colleagues from OpenShift AIBU, uh, Chris. Uh, the whole uh, source code, what, what we are seeing right now, the use case. So he actually used some of the ready-made Hugging Face uh, uh, models and that's what we are using. So that's why we are not seeing our Red Hat Teddy, right? Because it's not customized to my images, right? So what I need to do is, I need to actually fine tune. Uh, so I need to have Red Hat Teddy images. I need to make it learn, right? And build a model out of that. So what I do in this particular fine tuning stage is where I actually train this model. Okay, I'm doing a training here. Uh, this, the training part, I use uh, some of the accelerators here to actually do the training. Okay, using a training uh, dream booth. Again, uh, this is a program, Python uh, code from Hugging Face, which we actually use here. And this is the training which actually took like 30 minutes on for this specific images. So I did an 800 epoch and uh, like 200 images were trained uh, from the Red Hat Teddy to understand that, yeah, this is Red Hat Teddy, an image, and then different images which needs to be catered to, right, to actually give you an output, okay, which needs to be, like, merged with your uh, Red Hat Teddy. So this, uh, once I finish this, right, it actually, uh, I export this into an ONNX format, which is a runtime format which we support on OpenShift uh, AI. Uh, this is the format which I convert my, all my models into, and it gets installed into my uh, storage, which is the AWS storage, uh, which is uh, an object storage. Right. So, yeah, this is where I actually move it and store it into S3. So you see all this, uh, and then, uh, then I upload this into an S3 uh, storage. Once this is there, right, I actually need to tell OpenShift Data Science that you need to do a model serving using the four models which we have generated. And then using those four, those four models, we can then uh, uh, go through the third Jupyter Hub, which actually does inferences, right? Okay, exactly, get the image, understand the text, and build, generate a new image, right, based on those two combination parameters. So this is uh, where actually I create a serving runtime. Uh, I actually use a custom model server. I used uh, Triton here. Um, I think you can see the Triton image, yeah. I see the Triton uh, image here. I create a Triton server, um, which is again a runtime to run the ONNX uh, models onto that. And then I actually push these four models which I have, right, from my storage. You guys, it's visible, right, back in the middle? Yes, no? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, I just wanted to check whether you're attending, you're attentive or not, right? Good, thank you. So, <clears throat> yeah, text to image, basically this is what I'm using at the path. This is where my models have been stored on the uh, S3 bucket. And uh, there are four models. Um, they are do doing different functionalities that is combined to actually provide you one outcome. And this is my inference here. So let's say <coughs> currently, uh, this is, you see this? This looks like Teddy, right? Yeah. So Teddy is right now in a mall. And I, want, I had trained it, so the dog image is Teddy. So in a mall. So let's say I want to make that on a beach, for example, right? The moment I, I, I run this, this is a nice thing about Jupyter Hub notebook, like you can just write it in a, 
you can run it in a stepwise mode in this and get the outcome. So this will run for a, a minute or so. I think it's using GPU in the backend uh, to kind of like uh, create the image. Once the image is done, you should then be able to see whether Teddy is actually on the beach or not, right? So that's the image I expect it to get generated. Um, okay. So uh, how many of you have used uh, Open Data Hub? Anyone using Open Data Hub? No, right. So you should definitely act, go and check out Open Data Hub. Or maybe you should actually go and uh, explore that because it's, it has some nice cool tools uh, for you to use. Here, our Teddy is there on the beach, right? Okay, so I can say Teddy is in my house, right? So it will actually have an apartment photo sitting behind that, right? So that's the generative uh, AI we are talking about here. Now what I do is, let's say instead of Teddy, right, I want uh, some other image to be trained and a new model to be generated, right? Every time I need to keep uh, pushing that uh, fine tuning, uh, pointing to my storage, right? Instead of that, I can parameterize that so that, uh, and then build a pipeline. So what I do is I'll actually have this pipeline here, uh, which I created using all these three. I mean, you can use any, depending on what kind of, uh, how you are generating your models, right? How you are actually getting your data, uh, doing your feature extraction and fine tuning and training and things like that. You can actually, in between, I don't have this model serving, uh, thing yet, but that is a task which I can add as well, so that the models are served locally on the inference, uh, and then um, you can actually use the third remote uh, inference notebook here to actually get the inference like we did. Uh, now let's say I want to just run this, right? Okay, and say text to image. So this submitted uh, a Tecton pipeline, right, into my OpenShift data science. So here, that is, this is the pipeline gets created. These are the, ta uh, okay, I see. These are the tasks. I'm running, this is experimentation, then I do the um, uh, training, and then finally the model serving part, right? So this is how you actually convert your uh, pipelines into real time, uh, like a uh, real Tecton pipeline, okay, which gets executed, and you don't have to worry as a data scientist uh, uh, whether uh, to configure everything, right? It's there, right? As part of your editor, you can actually edit and create this pipeline. And um, just boom, yeah, you just uh, execute it and you have this pipeline ready running in your OpenShift pipelines, right? So it actually leverages and it's tightly integrated with the OpenShift uh, application platform here. Right, so... So this is where you see the run output, and you see all the runs here. Now, uh, I mentioned model serving, right, uh, where I had actually, these are the four models being served here, and these are all inf inter inf internal services. Uh, we are using gRPC. You can actually host it, this as external model serving also if you want to do uh, model serving as a service offering, right? Okay, you can actually uh, do it so everything can be an API connect using RESTful API. <laughs> And uh, um, like I do a gRPC. gRPC, by the way, works very fast compared to, uh, to uh, the REST API. Uh, very, very fast, actually. So that's why, I w because this is all internal in-house into the same environment. Otherwise, you can also use uh, REST URLs, like we have it here. Or you can externally connect it through TLS uh, extended uh, security. And uh, you can host your inferences and just do an API RESTful call and it should be able to call this uh, model uh, and should be able to give an output to you. So that's what we are doing here and this Jupyter Hub notebook, the third one, right? So we are actually, if you see here in this initially, so we are, yeah. So we are actually calling up this model serving its port and these are the four models which we have hosted, we are actually calling that. Now if I go to OpenShift, right, uh, in my workloads, so I have this model serving.
Yeah. And it has uh, the gRPC port 8033 being mapped here. So it's going and actually calling this, and the inferences are running within this particular model serving. So you can create your own model servers, and you can, uh, depending on what is your runtime for those specific models, you can have custom model serving also for your specific requirements. So, yeah, you like the teddy on the beach? Yeah? Sorry? Can't hear you. Oh, yeah, of course. So that's how you can uh, you train your, your image and say you are on Eiffel Tower, it will actually show you on Eiffel Tower, right? Uh, that's a good use case. Okay, I think, uh, I think we have some time to take questions on OpenShift AI. And yeah, uh, sorry, can we have Mike, please? you can have your own notebooks and your serving runtimes and all. Hi, uh, my question is, uh, is there a free tier available of, uh, and how is it different from Google's Colab? Google's? Colab. Colab, okay. Colab, uh, we have any uh, trial available? For yeah, yeah. Uh, so once you go to um, the sandbox which was shown uh, in the morning, so you can Where? go to console.redhead.com, oh, sorry, developers.redhead.com. So in, in Ashwin's talk, you might have seen how to get access to uh, developer sandbox. So once you go to the developer sandbox, uh, yeah, the, the one, yeah. So you can, here, you can start your sandbox for free. So it'll take you to the um, custom po customer portal. But will I get uh, a GPU option for the free tier? Yes, okay. I need to check <laughs> uh, because they keep changing. Uh, so yeah, uh, you want me to? Uh, I can get my laptop. Oh, yeah, sorry. Submit and see if it works. Yeah, I think it's coming up. Yeah, so... Uh, this is where... Uh, yeah, see, so over you here can we try. have the... Okay, you can try, you can try it, it in, in the sandbox. sandbox. Okay, and there are... So here, there are uh, different... Uh, you, can, you can bring your own scenario, or there are different scenarios out here, which you can try I think it for, on yeah, basic learning, yeah. these scenarios are good enough. Like, uh, you yeah. launch your OpenShift Data Science, you create a PyTorch model, TensorFlow model. Uh, and you'll be doing all of this uh, activities hands-on, on the OpenShift Data Science sandbox. Yeah. Okay, sure, thank you. Yeah, but it's not... Uh, really powerful enough GPUs so that you can mine bitcoins or something. <laughs> but if yeah. you're thinking of training <laughs> is, a model... Uh, for I training think models and all, uh, you can. Yeah. <laughs> because for uh, Google Collab, <laughs> we get, I think, a hundred GPUs. Um, you can run, in parallel, you can run two different uh, GPU environments. Yeah. And that's something which I keep saying, right? Uh, you need to reduce the crypto, uh, sorry, uh, cognitive load. Uh, check for your servers and infrastructures, passwords at least, uh, to, to be secure. Because one of the most common thing is then, uh, especially the free tiers and all which comes, people uh, use it as bot instances to mine for cryptocurrency. So yeah, so always secure your own systems and even your own laptops. <laughs> so Thank if you, you are thinking of getting your data scientist, uh, let's say you have an OpenShift platform or a Kubernetes platform, you want your data scientist to actually be onboarded on that platform, right? Like your developers are. So that's, this is the best way to actually start. Either use this or use an open data hub. Okay, then they are right on your OpenShift platform and they, they, they will not even realize that. Actually. Yeah. So the thing is, the that's data scientist wouldn't know what a CI-CD pipeline is or yeah. uh, how he needs to manage his cloud. What happens is he's just working with his Jupyter notebooks and all. The application pipeline is being created in the back end and securely being deployed to the uh, target environments. Yeah, so the same way the application developers are not sure what ecosystem, they might or might not be sure what, what tool sets and tools which the 
the data scientists in their organization are working, but they need to use the results from their, uh, uh, from their output in order for their applications to be served. So both of these things work in tandem. Like, see, like say, for example, if you say the application developers would understand how a Git workflow is, okay? But a data scientist might not work might not understand what a Git workflow is and how do you do like Git by Because their tools are totally different. They are going to work with Jupyter Notebooks or some other workspace like that. So that way, onboarding a developer, ML and uh, ML engineers and uh, your AI engineers is very easy over here because they are not burdened with the cognitive load of learning how an application pipeline is being deployed. They are just working on their own uh, models. Yeah, if so they know it is great, but not right. yes. Yeah. Developer hub, it becomes easy for developers to be onboarded, right? Yeah. The same concept which goes here as well. And with Alira, there are a lot of enhancements going on with Alira, so that the, the whole of Innerloop pipeline, right, the data science specific or ML specific pipelines, yeah. uh, you, you don't have to, the data scientists don't have to worry, just drag and drop their Python codes, or whoever is actually managing that whole thing, right, uh, for example, a data scientist, they can just uh, collect, uh, just, just pull in the Python codes from the data engineers, from the machine learning engineers, right, and then yeah. the application developers, and then just build their own pipeline to be deployed right into your production. Yeah, okay, and now this system. product name has changed from yesterday night, <laughs> we okay, got to know. Yeah. It's open, Red Hat OpenShift AI. Uh, OpenShift Data Science is part of OpenShift AI, and it's, so it's, uh, yeah, thank you. So basically, it's, it's your uh, code to deployments all taken care from the single platform. So I can't hear you. So uh, it essentially is uh, code to your uh, deployment. It's deployment. all part of the same yeah. with. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. While using your ML engineers also onto the same. Thank you very much. Systems. So like, uh, like I said, if you have ML engineers within your organization, uh, like develop, developer hub, you might have to write uh, what tools and uh, what are the things which they, they need along with your application pipeline. So your uh, template might be a bit bigger, but you can onboard both the teams together. Uh, onto project because uh, what happens is the, uh, in many organizations, especially the enterprises, most of the developers might already be onboarded onto OpenShift kind of a ecosystem, right? They they are already uh, they are already in their Kubernetes pipeline, but getting the uh, getting the ML engineers onto this pipeline is very difficult. So by using a developer hub template along with the underlying infrastructure which provides everything, it's easy for you to onboard uh, even the ML engineers onto the projects. Yeah, we eventually we can have a Jupyter Hub link there, right? Whatever you see in uh, the OpenShift application platform from the OpenShift AI route perspective, right, for Jupyter Hub, when it gets created as a workbench, eventually we can actually have it as part of the, uh, the developer hub, right? Okay. But that's, I think, something Mohit was mentioning that they are thinking of yeah. right now. And, and on developers.radar.com is not just uh, OpenShift. Uh, most of our products, uh, you can find the trials over here or even sandbox versions over here. You can use it and uh, uh, get, like, like say, most of our licenses are very portable. Like for example, if you want, if you're provisioning your OpenShift infrastructure in AWS in another zone on ARO, you can take, you can take your models from here and just deploy it out there. You can try it out here in the sandbox and then you can, uh, think. most of the sandboxes are available for um, 30 days, but we have a Slack channel if you want to extend it out there or if you already have uh, your compute from one of the cloud providers you can just export it onto that cloud also after you do your experiments so. any uh, we can have one more question if there's any other question any further questions okay i think then yeah, yeah. and and, and also uh, maybe in the evening we can cover we also have a slack channel so if you want certain kind of sandboxes to train up your teams or onboard your teams, uh, you can come and request over there and we can, yeah. depending on our cycles, we can uh, create the scenarios or we can create the environments. So there is yeah. a last track I am doing here. Uh, again, that's more to do with GitOps and uh, how it plays a role, right? But I'm actually going to touch upon MLOps through GitOps. So if someone is interested, uh, yeah, please join that talk as well. If, if you are more interested in MLOps, to be sure. Okay, right. I think thank you for yeah. joining. Thank you for Let's your time. Let's break for lunch. Yeah. Thank you.